Welcome to the Fundamentals of Sports Medicine Cervical Spine Lecture 101. Today's lecture was created by and large by our contributor and partner, Adam McCauley, who's on the call tonight as well. However, it's going to be presented by Ken and myself tonight. We're going to go through the anatomy, physical exam, and basics of x-ray interpretation for cervical spine. And of course, as usual, Fundamentals of Sports Medicine has no disclosures, financial or otherwise, to disclose at this time. If you haven't already followed us on our social media accounts, please do it. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook are all good ways of getting at us. And if you're not on the email list for some reason, email us at fundamentalsofsm at gmail.com. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so, though, talking about the physical exam uh, of the neck. And I'm gonna pay special attention to the brachial plexus uh, and nerve injuries because I think that's gonna be the highest yield for anybody who's involved with a cervical spine injury. Now, of course, inspection is going to be the first part of any physical exam. I would say generally I'm not seeing masses. What I'm looking for typically in inspection of the neck is more symmetry and a close inspection actually of the musculature Bilaterally, bilaterally, looking for deltoid um, cupping or flattening of the deltoid head, looking for any scapular winging uh, or checking the posture of their trapezius muscles. Um, I think that inspection is something that should be done somewhat methodically, though I, I admit that it's relatively low yield. Uh, always check for the anterior entry for cervical spine surgery as well, which can at times be difficult to recognize um, as it can look uh, occasionally like a thyroid surgery actually, but uh, something that I've, I've, I guess, been burned on before. So make sure to check for it at least. For palpation for me, um, I'm always trying to differentiate uh, when somebody has neck tenderness uh, between the paracervical muscles and the midline cervical tenderness that could be more indicative of a fracture. And so what I'll try to do is very carefully feel down along the spinous processes on the cervical spine until you get to C7. C7 can be very easily identified as the most prominent of your cervical vertebrae. It's the vertebrae that if anybody feels like they're slowly becoming a hunchback, that's the vertebrae that you're feeling almost uh, invariably. It also is the last mobile vertebrae in your neck as you come down looking at it. Um, this is because of course the thoracic vertebrae all have ribs attached to them and therefore more, uh, the column is more stationary. And so if you actually flex a patient's neck, you should be able to feel movement through their cervical vertebrae, feeling the normal cervical lordosis until you get to C7, and C7 should be the most prominent and the last one that you feel. I'll also then feel paraspinally up along the uh, column at the muscles, trying to determine if there's any tenderness or pathology there. And I almost always finish my exam here on the greater occipital nerve. Um, this is a point of tenderness in a lot of people. It's a basis for a lot of cervicogenic headaches and a great mimicker for concussion-like symptoms. Uh, this is an area that I would always recommend people are checking after a cervical injury or when somebody has a muddled presentation with a possible concussion with neck whiplash injury, palpation over the greater occipital nerve can help to differentiate the basis or source of this pain. And it's something that I think that uh, unless you're careful about checking for it, you could write it off as a headache and therefore continued concussion symptoms. We're gonna look at strength now again. Uh, strength as usual is measured on a zero to five scale. The strength exam in the neck is one of the most useful ones I think because typically what I really do in neck exam is I'm really looking at the brachial plexus. Uh, and so if we go on actually one, one more image, um, we'll actually look at strength and sensation together. I'm gonna to go over a clinical sideline strength and sensation exam that I would recommend that everybody commit to memory. And it almost works better as a sort of dance. And I think for anybody who's listened to my, I gave a pre-lecture once on this a couple of months ago where we talked about the 
uh, checks for strength when you're examining an athlete on the sideline with a possible cervical injury or a possible brachial plexus injury. Now, I haven't set this to music, but no, I'm just going to move through it and uh, say the names of the nerve roots as I'm going through it so that people can, if they'd like, do it along to themselves. I'll give everybody five seconds to turn off their video if they want to do it. But as with many things related to memory, if you can connect the memory to a physical movement, it'll help to be retained. And going through a methodical brachial plexus check, looking at the nerve roots individually is very important and useful clinically. And being able to do it quickly is valuable when you're on the sideline and not having to look in your phone or checking some other resource to know if you're checking all the appropriate nerve roots. So again, the strength testing is conducted uh, on a scale of zero to five. I'm typically doing this exam on football or rugby players, and therefore, they're typically quite strong. I would, as just one extra pearl, advise that people really try to use their strength to determine any difference between the left and right side of a patient with or an athlete with symptoms. So starting with C5, we have C5 with abduction of the shoulder and elbow flexion, this is C5, C5. C6 is wrist extension. C7 is elbow extension. C8 is finger flexion, and I'll check that by trying to grab and forcefully extend an athlete's fingers. And then finally, T1 is finger abduction. And so to run that through again, we'll go C5 with, el with shoulder abduction, elbow flexion, wrist extension is C6, elbow extension is C7, finger flexion is C8, finger abduction is T1. And again, being able to do this quickly on the sideline where you can run an athlete through this bilateral exam where they lift their arms against resistance, where they try to flex their biceps against resistance, keep their wrists in a neutral position while they try to extend. Um, finger flexion and finger abduction can help you to quickly run through the brachial plexus exam and to at least in a gross sense rule out a dramatic brachial plexus injury after somebody comes off the sideline complaining of symptoms that are consistent with a stinger or a burner. In other words, a brachial plexus distraction injury. Now, similarly, the sensation should be checked and is even easier to check. Again, we're going from C5 to T1. And the way that I do this exam, I'm gonna tilt my camera down just a little bit so people can see me a little bit better. You feel along the outside of the arm, going through C5, still C5. And then once you get to the hand or into the wrist, you're going C6, C7, C8, and then finally medial elbow is T1. Running through that again, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1 is medial. I don't know if it's worth going over this again. I know this stuff is complicated. We're gonna potentially revisit it again later in the lecture. But this is one of the most important things that I think you can take away from a cervical spine exam. There is one other test that I've put in here. But by and large, the cervical spine exam is scary because of how much pathology that's potentially serious you could see in it. But being able to differentiate between, for example, nerve root compression and brachial plexus injury is quite important. And doing these strength and sensation tests can help for sure to determine which nerve is being affected at least. Ken, do you have more to add to this part, by the way? I, I think that it's, I think that it's, uh, it's actually great what, what you talk. I will add just, just a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. So C5, it, I, I will add the muscles to it maybe a little bit more. C5 is deltoid bicep six are the extensors of the wrist, um, seven is the tricep, uh, eight is the wrist flexors, and nine are the interossei muscle. So if, T1. If you know, 
a T1, sorry, C1, I apologize. Yeah, a C9, actually. <laughs> T1. So then if you remember those muscles, uh, actually, it, it'd be very beneficial. And to know, just to add what Max said, uh, when you get a stinger, the, the nerves that are normally affected are C5, C6. So if you know that that's the nerve that's being affected, then I would check, first off, deltoid and bicep first, right? And stingers are usually a, a unilateral thing versus a bilateral thing. So it's really, really important. So check it. They're, these guys are big, strong guys. So make sure they, they actually give you everything they got. That's a great point. The last thing that I want to talk about as a special test is Sperling's test. Sperling's test is something that probably many of you have learned in various points in your residency or in training. And so rather than talk too much about just how to do the exam, I'm going to give you guys the clinical pearls that I think are relevant for Sperling's exam. And so what I've done here is I've collected three images from the internet, as usual. The leftmost image is the one that I feel is done the best. And I'll talk about why the ones on the right, I think, are not done quite as well, or what the issues are, at least, with it. Now, in principle, Sperling's test is trying to exacerbate a nerve root compression or injury. This is almost always going to be in the setting of either disc herniation or osteophyte formation. And so when you're seeing a positive spurling test, it's going to either be in an older person or an older athlete. Younger athletes with nerve injuries tend to be stingers or burners. In other words, tend to be brachial plexus injuries, these distraction injuries. It takes time to degenerate either the uh, discs of the spine or to form osteophytes such that you can begin to compress the nerve roots and therefore get a positive Sperling's test. Now, it's not impossible. Uh, college football players will begin to lose that cervical lordosis, which can predispose you a bit to having positive uh, results here, or at least begin to show some degenerative changes. But let me talk a little bit about why I enjoy the image on the left so much. Now, what you can see here is that the uh, examiner, first of all, is standing behind the patient, which I think is very useful when doing Sperling's test. There's a temptation to stand in front of the patient, which I think is a little awkward to grab a patient's face or head from in front of them and manipulate them. What the practitioner on the left is doing is he is, of course, putting the head into extension and a little bit of lateral flexion, and then he's giving this axial compression downward through the skull along the cervical spine. But if you notice, he has both of his elbows actually in contact with the patient. And what that does is it allows him to manipulate the head and spine without adjusting the trunk or forcing the patient to reflexively tense their neck and potentially get a false negative result here. Both the practitioners on the right have their elbows lifted off from the patient. Additionally, I feel that both the right two images don't have the head in the correct orientation. The middle image is not enough into extension where I believe that axial compression is actually pinching off these nerve roots. And similarly, the image on the right is in such lateral flexion that I believe what's happening is that you're probably going to distract the contralateral side of the neck of where you actually want to test. Now, again, you're doing Sperling's test when you suspect a possible nerve root impingement or uh, a paresthesia or numbness, some sort of a muscle atrophy, where you're going to be seeing symptoms on the same side as you're flexing the neck. And that makes sense anatomically, that when you try to bend the head and compress the nerve roots on that side, that that is the arm and shoulder that you'll be exacerbating symptoms on. Now, contrast this to somebody with a stinger or a burner, or again, this brachial plexus distraction injury where the nerves have been stretched. So I would expect that in that case, because the distraction injury is going to be exacerbated from stretching those fibers, doing a Sperling's test, if let's say, for example, I have left arm symptoms, if a practitioner is checking my left side after a uh, stinger or a burner and they do a left-sided spurling exam, I would expect this to not bother my left arm at all. 
I would expect it to actually feel better because the brachial plexus in here is being uh, given more room to, um, I wouldn't say compress, but it certainly isn't being distracted. It's not being pulled apart. And in contrast, if they check my right-sided spurling, this would cause potentially some distraction here, and I may feel a worsening of symptoms on my left side. It's uh, where I think people can, through some careful thought, uh, actually glean some valuable information from this. I think there's just one more slide here, but Ken, anything to add on the spurling exam? No, that's really good. Really good explanation. Good job, Max. Thanks. Nice. Um, I think this is just a uh, word of caution that anytime you have, uh, for example, bilateral symptoms where you really suspect that a neck injury has occurred, you want to place the patient on a spine board. And I added this image just as one more time to mention that when you have a football player in particular with a suspected spinal injury, you don't remove the helmet, not because you're worried necessarily about disrupting a potential cervical injury, but because the shoulder pads, when left on, will force the head into extension when the helmet is removed. The helmet is designed with the shoulder pads on to keep the head in a neutral position. And so removing the helmet is going to leave the head in extension somewhat. Just one more thing to remember for the sideline, but it's something that we'll, we've talked about in the past and we'll talk about again in the future. You do remove the face mask though to get access to the airway just in case. That's a good point. Yeah, definitely remove the face mask. <laughs>